Hey folks, in this interview, I'm going to be talking with Melissa Bunny Elian. We're going to be talking about a project that she's been working on for quite some time now. It's called Generation TBD. This is Twitter. All right, folks, welcome back to This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. I've got Melissa Bunny Elian on the line here. We're going to be, like I said in the intro there, diving into some specifics about this cool project that she's been working on, the passions behind that project, what it takes to execute on a project like that, as well as some of the, the deeper things, like how does a project like this change you fundamentally as an artist? Because everything that we do, each time we do a project, we take something away from it or it could take something away from you. So we're gonna find out all about that in this interview. So Bunny, I can call you Bunny, right? Yes, please. Welcome to the show, how are you doing? I'm a little warm, Yeah, it's summer <laughs> and I'm not complaining about it. You are, we, as we were talking about before we started, you're in, uh, make sure I get the accent right, Yonkers, New York, out there. It, it's summer and it's burning hot, right? Yeah, I think we're in the middle of the heat wave. And I'm in the attic. <laughs> yeah, and you're in the attic, so you got all the heat, all the heat, and everything going on. So rising and falling on Tommy, yeah, all that. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. All right, so um, I want to dive into this. So I'm, I'm really interested to, to find out about how this project, this, this uh, generation TBD started, and what it's taking to keep it going, and why you're keeping it going. So before we dive into the project, tell us a little bit about you. Like what you as a photographer, what, what's your origin story? What got you in into the world of taking pictures of people? My origin story is I've been taking photographs since I was in high school. But I didn't realize I could make a career out of it until college. When I took a history class, um, exploration into Judaism, mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the different uh, electives I could take. Yeah. So through that class, I got to see how history takes shape over centuries. Yeah. And it brought me to the realization that news is a current draft of history. And it was the first time I got to understand the Palestinian and Israeli conflict, but in the span of like centuries. So it really helped shape my conception of the present, which is just a matter of time and how the past builds up to the present moment. And along, around that same time, I joined a photography group, University Photo Service. And that's when I really uh, became aware that photojournalism was a profession that I could pursue. Yeah. So yeah. Two coming together really forms my genesis. That's cool. It's cool. Yeah. And it's, uh, you, it's really prophetic what you said, you know, the sort of the history or the, the present current news or current events are, or history is just a past version of that. And so you are, you are diving in to document what's happening now, knowing that it's basically on a never ending roll of paper, right? It's going to be in the past at some point in the future. Right. And I know people say history re um, repeats itself. Mm -hmm. And me and my friend in college, we came up with the term, like it's an evolving loop. It's like similar things happen, yeah. but it is a little bit different. So, you know, our, Lifetime is our go around this loop. So what yeah. we do has impact on this next shape of that next cycle. Yeah. So in terms of the photography side of things, what brought you to this? I mean, yeah, of course, the document history, but like in, in terms of there are many different ways that you could have chosen to go, right? You could have could have been just straight journalism, writing or video or you know, choose your poison. What was it about photography that, that drew you into the medium? You know, I credit MySpace. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> because, yeah, um, because it was the first time where I was really putting myself out there and I wanted to visually convey a message. So like whatever mood I was in, you know, I guess um, it would start with those selfies that would go with the song, that would go with the graphics, that would yep. convey like my current mind state. 
So I really, you know, and from there, I would just always have my camera around and I would photograph my friends and I wouldn't do it in like a posy way. I would let them, you know, forget that I was taking pictures and then like capture it and just uh, manipulating those photos and Photoshop and just like really conveying a mood Mm -hmm. that really, I've always been interested in people like uh, nature photography is cool and all that, but it's just like, I really, really care about people and portraying them. And you can tell a story. That's what I tell people like landscape photography, nature photography, um, or, you know, those genres of photography I love. I know many photographers that do those sorts of things, but Mm -hmm. when you're photographing people, I, I feel like a person can appreciate your work much more than a beautiful sunset can, you know? So, yeah. and you could, you know, in many ways be more impactful and have more impact on people. You know, the, you take a photo of someone now, 10 years from now, that photo is important to them, right? Exactly. Like, I have so many friends who didn't want, in high school, who didn't want me to take their picture. And I would post it on Facebook and like, oh, do you have any pictures or you don't have any more pictures of me? I was like, nope, you didn't want me to take a picture. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's how it works. I got to aim the camera and press the button. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, tell me. Um, so uh, let's let's take the next step. So you're in photography. We understand w- kind of what the motivation is there. Then gear choices, because that's the other piece of it. Right. Mm-hmm. So diving in and and choosing choosing your weapon to do battle with. There's all kinds of choices out there that you could have made. Why did you choose the gear that you're using now? And what are you using? Right now I am using Fuji X-T2. Mm-hmm. I love it. Once I had it, I never thought about full frame or what other cameras. I literally stopped thinking about gear, but I liked it because it reminded me of where I started. Um, when I finally took photography seriously as like a a profession um so when i joined that photography group before then i was just using a point and shoot but when i joined that group i used a film camera a nikon f and so that's the camera i learned photography on wow and after that i had a canon 40d and i stayed in the canon family for a little bit um and then i got canon 7d and when i worked at a newspaper it was like it was more canon and gear too but when i got to freelance, suddenly I didn't have the latest technology. My camera, my images weren't as sharp as what other people were producing, but I had opportunity to borrow my friend's X Pro one. And I was really digging the external, um, settings that mimicked the film camera where I really learned. So I was really comfortable with the size as well. Um, and it's also less t- intimidating to people. So I fell in line with Fuji film, uh, digital cameras by chance. And when I saw that they were coming out with the X-T1, I got a chance to use those. But then the X-T2 like, really just blew me out the water. Yeah. It was like everything I wanted. Um, it was small. And, you know, but I think the most important part for me is that a lot of the work that I do is like I'm entering people's worlds. And so I don't want to have a telephoto in their face while I'm in their living room. Right. People are already wary of being that visualized. Um, you know, they're very hyper aware of their imperfections mm-hmm. um, and very camera wary. So just having that very small kit, you know, it kind of has people underestimate you in a way that actually benefits you and makes them more comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, I, and that's a good segue into the project, um, Generation TBD, because the what one of the questions I have is getting it, like for all photojournalists or people that do photo stories of people, et cetera, getting into a world, right, or getting into a subject's space and photographing it, how first of all with the with i want to talk about travis which you know which is which is part of this obviously this this project but when you when you get in that world do you find that you are impacting that world by virtue of being there you know or are you a fly on the wall or are you part of the story you're just part of the story that is telling the story how does how does that work for you well undoubtedly you are affecting a scenario when you're in it yeah 
Um, but what's most authentic is when the people that you are photographing are reacting to their lives. So, you know, uh, I can give an example. Like if something falls on the ground, you're not going to worry about how you look when you're trying to catch it. Right. Mm -hmm. So in that way, when things happen in people's lives, you kind of melt away into the background. But, you know, I'm a chatty person, so I had to catch myself sometimes when I'm, like, a little bit too talkative to people. Mm -hmm. um, I'll answer questions, and, you know, I'm not going to be rude and, like, like stop talking to me now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I've yeah. had that conversation, but, like, gently. Um, you know... You are part of that scene, but you you have your intentions clear from the beginning of what you're doing. Um, sometimes I've had to tell subjects, like I can tell when someone's trying to do something for me, and I tell them just to relax. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll try and like, just like talk to them for a little bit and just let them settle out of that mind frame. Yeah. Um, so it's tricky, especially with longer term things. Yeah. But Okay. So, okay. So here's another question. So as we dive into the, the generation sort of TBD project, Travis is the, the main subject of this, this project. Um, looking at some of the photos, which are fantastic, by the way, congratulations. Um, Thank you. Looking at those photos, it occurred to me, I had to go and look and see who you were, because I want to see who's the artist that's putting themselves in the situation, you know, and then I saw you. So I'm like, okay, how, one of the questions that I jotted down to ask you was, how are you able to navigate being a young woman with a camera in these situations and get the shot that you want and, and manage all that for other, other young women that are out there that are, that have aspirations to do photojournalism and want to walk in your footsteps. What's, what's kind of some of the advice that you would give them to, to be successful in that environment? Well, first Travis is actually, uh, one of my best friends from college, cool. but at that point we hadn't talked for a few years. Um, maybe just keeping in touch, but, um, you know, it was a known person that was photographed. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't a stranger. But I do enter a lot of situations where I don't, actually the majority of my situations are people I don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's half vigilance and half um, openness. So I've been in situations where I'm trying to get someone to work with me and, you know, they're kind of like hitting on you. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, hey, I'm actually working right now. I'm trying to do this story. If you don't want to work with me, that's fine. But like how you are right now is unacceptable. Yeah. And so, you know, just say it flat like that. It's not an attitude or anything. It's not like an alarming thing. But it's just like, hey, I'm about to like dip if you're not going to act right. Yeah, it's just it's like check yourself, fool. Yeah. <laughs> um, <but laughs> camera yeah. photographer that's the relationship we have right <laughs> right um that doesn't happen often but yeah i have no problem telling people about themselves if that does come up and what about I'm, safety like, though I'm always thinking in the back of your head it's just like how something can go sideways like i had um she went to the my grad school the year before me but she a woman was killed in Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, she was going to, she went in a submarine with an inventor and she turned up missing and later they found her body parts. So uh, it's super real Yeah. how open you, like the risks that people are willing to take to tell amazing stories. Like I can imagine me being in her situation being like, oh my gosh, I'm about to go in a submarine that this person made by himself that's so mm. cool and it's just like super sad because she yeah. told amazing quirky stories um but yeah it's it's a lot of people say myself included say that the the camera it, in a lot of ways is the passport to getting into situations that you may not have gotten into before right so you got your camera you know, oh, I'm a photographer. Of course, I'm going over there and you can meet new and exciting people using the camera that you wouldn't feel comfortable with, you know, approaching without the camera. But then as you were talking, it occurred to me that goes both ways. Right. So if you're a young, attractive woman and you have a camera and you're out there trying to do a job, that camera could also be the passport or the excuse for someone to come and talk to you 
and okay. and sort of interrupt your flow. Do you see that happening a lot? Oh my gosh! Can you tell? Can I tell you how many times people <laughs> have come and like told me about their gear and like I don't know, tried to like teach me things? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, I've been doing this for almost a decade. So it's just like, I let them finish their sentence and then I like tell them that, yeah, I do this. Yeah. They photosplain <laughs> to you. It's, it's photosplaining, right? right? <laughs> but you know, it's like, it happens and I don't yeah. get upset about it, but it's just like, you just read, you yeah. read situations, you read people. Yeah. No, that's cool. That's good. Well, you you sound like you handle it. You handle it extremely well. Well, tell me tell me about this this project, which is you corrected me in the beginning because I said this is a new project that you've been working on, Generation TV. But this is a project that is an ongoing, long term project. Tell me tell me about. So you you met Travis uh, in college. You guys kept in touch, and you decided to do the story. So tell first, give us. People will be watching this may may or may not have read the article that that will be published with this. I encourage people to to head over there and read the article so that you have all the context of the story. Um, but get wet our appetite. Like, how did this? How did the, the the Generation TBD come about? And you know, and and what's the overall goal that you're trying to reach and explain to people through your work? So, Generation TBD is actually a project that was started by the Global Post, uh, now The Ground Truth. Um, It was my first big project. It's 2014. And I was part, I, I learned a lot of my skills through the Bronx Documentary Center. So that was my part of the early part of my tenure there. Mm -hmm. Um, we were approached by the Global Post to contribute to this global project that they were doing, looking at millennials and the precariousness of the gig economy. And so so they had sent people to Italy, all over Africa, um, all over Europe, all over South America, to tell the millennial story of employment issues internationally Mm -hmm. and so they were hosting the the Bronx Documentary Center was hosting the fellows who were selected to do this work and so as part of that they invited us to do a portion about the Bronx um, and New York City so you know it was a really quick turnaround which is why I leaned on my network to see who I could photograph Mm -hmm. Um, and so they did this is part of a long-term project but it's not my long-term project our section was just a piece of it piece i'm very proud to have contributed to but basically the idea was what does it look like to struggle in this good economy if we were only a few years removed from the um the recession the global recession so we were just really looking at the millennial take on that yeah economy no, for the people that may not know what the gig economy is, describe that. What What is the gig economy? Part of the thing that one thing that happened after the recession is that companies were more reluctant to hire full time workers. You know, the expense of health care and uh, all these different things. Yeah. Part of the elimination of risk is elimination of jobs. So instead of hiring people full time, now you have con- more contract work. Um, people who can't find employment, maybe they'll go and sign up for Uber or do an Airbnb or temporary work to make things um, to be able to pay their bills. Yeah. So after 2008, the gig economy became more of a thing. So whereas it used to be a little more rare to say that you're a freelancer and not looked down upon, but it was like kind of like side-eyed. Mm. Now it's like, oh, you're a freelancer. We totally get it. It's like a complete shift. And that shift started after 2008. Yeah. Yeah. It used to be like the saying you're a freelancer was one step away from saying I'm unemployed. Right. It was like a right. fancy way you know, or, or, or saying I'm between jobs. I'm freelancing right now. Well, you're right. Now it's a thing, right? And and I mean, my parents still don't think I have a job. <laughs> yeah, which is good, right? And I, I mean, have one full time job. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. Like in the internet marketing world, they say like the 
the fallacy of the full time job. No disrespect to people that have full time jobs, you know, and are doing that. But the the part of the fallacy and the misconception is the the false sense of security that you have with a full time job, where every quarter rolls around and looking at that list of who to let go, you know, you could be, on, you could yeah. be on that list and suddenly you got a bad Christmas, right? It, it can happen. Whereas with the yeah. gig economy, it's kind of like, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, it's the, it's kind of like not having all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. It's you struggle because you got to, you know, sometimes you don't have any eggs in the basket, but mm-hmm. if you have four or five eggs and one of them breaks, you're still going to eat versus one egg, one basket to rule them all and to pay your mortgage and your car payment and feed your kids with. Right. Right. So, yeah. So that, that, that's interesting. So then as you, so tell me, just dive a little bit deeper into Travis and the, the, his, the, the story of Travis and what, like, where is that going and how is, how is Travis first of all? And then how are things going in that, in that particular vein of the story that you're telling? So you had preluded to a question that you wanted to get into about how, what working on such projects can do for people and what it does for the photographer. Yeah. So right now, Travis is doing extremely well. He is a digital producer at BET. Oh, wow. So when I was photographing him, you know, he's a young dad, 25 years old at the time, a five-year-old, and he had dropped out of school. He's two years younger than me. Um, he dropped out of school because his major was canceled, which is another result of, you know, budgets and government cutting back things. Yeah. And another response to the economy at the time. Yeah. And then also he had a death in the family. So he had depression. He had to choose a major that one that he was really passionate about, which was, um, music production. Um, and media that was eliminated and then the death in the family it's just like he's just he left school which a lot of people leave school because of different circumstances so it's not like anybody's a failure when that happens it's just like life happens yeah so at that time he was working retail and he was freelancing getting um, video work shooting music videos for upcoming artists and any gigs that he can get using his camera. Yeah, that's the power, right? I mean, we talked about it at the beginning because it, it taking photos allows you to get, a, especially if you're doing photojournalistic type work, gives you a snapshot of a particular situation, positive, negative, or otherwise. And, you know, depending on the photos can affect that situation. But look at it through the mirror, though, has the, the trajectory that you've seen Travis move on uh, you know, moving into BET and, 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 you know, providing for his five-year-old, which who's now 10, I guess. Right. <laughs> you know, um, has that affected you? How does, how has that affected you as the artist that, ha- that was there to see this, this tra- trajectory from, you know, one level to the next level? I think it just drives home what I do. Yeah. Every person that I put in front of my camera, I do so because I think that they're worth something. Yeah. And oftentimes I turn my cameras on on the marginalized because for me, what happens on the margins speaks to what's happening in the center. And if we don't pay attention to what happens on the margins, what's going to happen, what's happening on the edge is going to come to the center. And I think that's what we're seeing in our politics. There are people who have always suffered in the ways that now middle class people are starting to feel and they're freaking out and the electorate is like, I mean, and then politicians are responding to that. Yeah. Um, but for me, it was an extreme moment of pride when he told me that. I am very conscious of photographing people in a way that they would love to be seen. Yeah. Not that um, I'm like sugarcoating anything, but it's like no matter what your circumstances, there is respect to be due to that person. Yep, yep. There's that so, common vein of us of of us all being human, right? So whether you know you got a gazillion dollars in the bank or a gazillion pennies in the bank, you're 
we're all made of the same stuff, same DNA. We have the same emotions and, and that presumably is what connects us. Right. And you, you show the, you show that in a positive light is what I'm hearing. All right. I have a, I have a final question before we wrap this up. Um, before we started, I was asking you what your title was, you know, and I've spoken to, I've spoken to many, many, many hundreds of photographers. Um, most of them will say, yeah, I'm a photographer or just call me artist or, you know, something, something pedestrian like that. You, Bunny, however, <laughs> said you are a, a multimedia journalist, right? Yes. So define, and then I said multimediographer or whatever. So define, <laughs> <laughs> define what, what multimedia journalist means and why not just photographer or something, something more pedestrian like that. So I call myself a multimedia journalist because I take photos, I shoot video, and I also write. And I actually aspire to create story packages that create uh, use all three elements. Because for me, each one feeds our sensibilities in a different way. So there are things I can photograph that I can't write. There are things that I write that I can't photograph. And then what video does for me is like really transport someone into a moment mm -hmm. where you're kind of like the idea of being a fly on the wall is this video really just captures so many senses yep. of being like standing someplace and seeing something with your own eyes. So for me, it is important. And some people ask me, which one I choose, like which one I like the most. And I say, none, I need all of them <laughs> because each one is just so different. And why I chose journalists, cause I'm always, you know, this, no matter what, I'm always coming back to news story. So I usually tell feature stories, but there's a news element to it. Um, and I feel like multimedia really captures uh, the multiplicity of what I do to tell that story. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant because you're right. It is. It, you're not not to minimize a photographer or photography, but you're you you are doing much more than just taking photos. You're using multimedia, multiple media, right? right. And and you know it, it, to put a finer point on it, the the way that people consume photos today is generally digitally, right? It's going to be on a screen, it's going to be on a phone, it's going to be on a tablet or something like that. So they have a computer right there. Why not use other medium to tell the story if you can do that more accurately than just with a two-dimensional still image? So mm -hmm. no, I, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. I'm a, I'm a multimediographer. Hello, multimedia journalist. Never heard of that, and that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you are free to use it. You go. We'll both. We'll be the two multimediographers running around. Yeah, let's make a movement. Cool. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, cool. Yeah. Literally and figuratively, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's next? What's next for money? So, what's what what, what what what's the next thing that you're going to do to change the planet? Ooh, I like that question. <laughs> so. My heart is sent on international stories. And so right now I'm actually pursuing a story about Afropunk, which is a music festival that primarily fo it focuses on um, black musical acts that are outside of the world of hip hop and rap and whatever people usually consider urban. Yeah. So it's like the other black experience is mm -hmm. that used to be their tagline. So I am documenting it as it goes international and seeing how it's being received in other countries and other cultures. So in pursuit of that story, I've been to London, Paris, and Johannesburg. I came from Paris this week. I came back on Tuesday, um, and there was the festival there last weekend. Uh, just getting an update on that story. And so that's what I'm working on now. And then after that, I'm going to finish my master's project, which is looking at city planning and social hierarchy and how cities are governed in ways that perpetuate um, social and economic stagnation in particular areas of the city. 
That's cool. You are doing important work. I love it. I love it. Congratulations. That was really cool. So if people want to see this stuff, you know, whether it's the, the Generation Project or any of this, you know, the Afropunk Project, anything that you're working on, what's the best location for them to, you know, point their web browser at? I would say HelloBunny.com. Hello Bunny with an I. That's my personal portfolio website, which has not been updated in a while, but it will be. But Generation to be um, TDD is TDD is there. And if you want more recent work, you can go onto my Instagram, which is also Hello Bunny, where I post outtakes and whatever I'm working on right now, and also projects that I haven't posted anywhere that I just want to be seen. Yeah. Um, and yeah. if people if people want to hire you for an assignment, they should reach out to you through what Instagram or your website. All my information is on my website. Okay. Uh, you can DM me as well. And yes, if you want to hire me, I will work with you. Let's do it. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. See, I was giving you the opportunity to make that pitch. You know. Yes. 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 Cool. All she right. Well, types of people. Anywhere in the world, let's make it happen. <laughs> yep. Have you got a bag packed with a camera, charged batteries, and empty memory card, and you are ready to go, right? Yes, I pack light. I'm ready to go right now. <laughs> cool. Cool. All right, Bunny. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this today. I realize that you're you are burning hey. up over there, you know. I am. <laughs> okay. I'm alive. This is fantastic. You, this was worth it. This is, you'll be cool in ten minutes. So this was, this is worth it. I appreciate it. Good audio. Yeah, no, it was good. It was good. I feel bad because it's so cool here, and I'm just like <laughs> sweating over there. All right, all sacrifice. Yeah, no, no, it's all good. All right, well, stay in touch. Stay in touch, and and you know, I'd love to have you come back on on this week in photo again when you're you know when you switch to the next project or. You know, if you just want to chat photo, just let me know. Okay, sweet. All right. Take care. We'll see you next time. Bye. This is Twitter.